Ani in the way ma knak. Ani shna be nak way in ane na tizne kaz monkey chan. Ki na tonchi a ki na tonchi. The dinna way ma knak my relatives. I welcome you to our show today. What is land based learning? My name is Dustin Brass, and I'm going to be moderating this panel. I'm looking for uh, a variety of input from across the country as we look into what is land-based learning. I'm a lecturer and placement coordinator at the First Nations University of Canada, and I'm the regional coordinator for Saskatchewan for NCCIE. NCCIE stands for National Centre of Collaboration in Indigenous Education. The NCCIE is an online digital resource centre of Indigenous education programming and knowledges across Canada. Currently the project is in its third year and it has over 500 stories. Stories are told in a variety of languages including Indigenous languages, English, French, Mohawk, Soto, Dene, Cree, etc. Resources this year are being used for curriculum development. Today I want to welcome you into a panel that we're going to be doing alongside three people across Canada. And we're asking them the question about what is land-based learning. All three of these panelists have extensive knowledge and extensive background in dealing with the experiences of land-based learning. I myself have spent many times too working with land-based learning and interaction with, with the land as the land-based learning uh, professor at First Nations University. It's part of our component for Indigenous education. Today the introduction, and I want to do an introduction to the digital forum. We're having uh, people uh, log in across on this Facebook Live format and later on in, in the show we'd ask that you submit your uh, comments and then those comments will be able to be answered as from our panelists. I want to look at some, some of the work that's happening already around the country. So if we could go to a live look at some of the things that are happening within the country. We started working with our communities to outline a, a framework for stewardship, ways to take care of the land that reflected the perspectives. And they came up with um, principles to guide the way we would develop programming and plan and so um, the first principle was the Dene laws, um, implementing and following our Dene laws. We need to push harder than we are with our people for uh, um, you know the mainstream education, the math, uh, science, language, all that kind of stuff. But I think that it has to be done from uh, an Inuak perspective. Um, because, you know, these reserves that we live in, um, you walk around the reserve and it's not hard to tell that these were designed as internment camps. These were not designed as uh, places where people would flourish and thrive. But again, you know, we've thrived here for thousands of years. So there's no reason why we can't take this education and use it to uh, empower ourselves to redesign our communities. But the only way that we can redesign our communities is to really understand science, to really understand mathematics, architecture, all that kind of stuff. But again, if it's done with that First Nations, with that Inuit perspective, then we know how to do this in a healthy way. We know how to do this in a way that goes back to our foundation of living with the land, of being connected like that. Across this country. When I was talking about the NCCIE resource site, that's what I was talking about. There are videos such as that, 500 plus videos, that talk about the programming that's happening across the country and the indigenous knowledges that are important to share. I just want to recap how to interact. So you can comment on Facebook if you have a question that you want to ask one of our panelists. You can also text 306-840-8777 or email contact at nccie.ca. We'll ensure that your questions get asked by one of our, to our panelists. The first panelist I want to introduce you to is a man by the name of Willie Ermine. Willie Ermine comes from Sturgeon Lake um, First Nation and he has been doing extensive work in the Healing Centre and 
continually engaging in land-based learning. He's a retired uh, professor at the First Nations University, but is continuing his work with uh, youth and land-based learning. Willie, I want to start off with, to you, what is land-based learning? <coughs> Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that are watching in. I notice all the locations. I see one from Lima, Peru, for example. So I acknowledge all the people that are watching. Land-based learning is, uh, uh, I, I think, still a question in process, in progress. Uh, it means a lot to many people. Uh, but I th if I put it very simply, uh, if we think about children, how much they do not label the world that they're immersed in, how much they enjoy the world. I look at a two-year-old and they, they just love the outdoors, just running around naked outside, enjoying the weather, no matter what kind of weather it is, um, and also enjoying all the nature has to provide without actually having to have labels on what it is that they're engaging with. So to me, land-based learning is really about how we engage with the world around us. And it's not an intellectual, intellectual exercise, but rather I think it, it forces us to use our feelings, our heart, and the child inside of us. We need to engage with the world in that way again, once again, so that we our understanding improves about the world that we live in. Thank you, Willie. I, uh, it's so important that we talk through the, the domains of emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical as we think about the land-based learning. I want to introduce you to our next guest is Lisa. Mershano uh, Kershain. She's a member of the Bitigong Nishnabe, formerly Ojibwe's of the Pick River First Nation from the Bear Clan family. Lisa spent most of her life in the community and alongside the North Shore of Lake Superior, spending time on the land and embracing the teachings from her parents and grandparents and elders. Upon completion of her formal education and return to the community, she has been involved in the education system for 20 years, teaching various grades and administration levels. She is a wife and proud mother of three sons and a daughter. Good afternoon, Lisa. How are you today? I, Great. I want to start off with um, the question I asked for, asked Willie, and that is, what is land-based learning? Uh, I want to start to create a definition for the people who are viewing, and also so that their stories can come alongside and, and we can gain traction in this understanding of land-based learning. So, Lisa, what is land-based learning in your perception? To start off with, I don't think the concept is an old concept. It, it, it might be the latest trend, per se, in, in the systems out there today, but it really is about uh, embracing the teaching um, from where we came from, which is the earth, the land. Uh, there's a lot of, it, it seems to be the, the biggest trend, I guess, in education. But really our ancestors have been doing what we're trying and attempting to do now with our children for many, many years. So it really is about connecting, making that connection to the earth and trying to figure out how it connects to what we do today and, and, and incorporating all aspects, meaning the mental, the physical, the spiritual and the emotional um, concepts of us as humans. Thank you, Lisa. I want to acknowledge all the people who are on this forum right now. It's, a, it's wonderful to see you across the nation. It was also important when we were selecting our panelists that they too were across the nation. We have to realize that although it is land-based education, although we have the heart of what we want to do, it looks different in different areas. So the next person I'd like to go to is Patsy McKinney. Patsy is Mi'kmaq from Dalhousie, New, New Brunswick, and her family is connected to the Eel River Bar First Nation. She has served as an executive director of Under One Sky since 2008. Patsy holds a Bachelor of uh, Philosophy of Interdisciplinary Leadership Studies. She serves as a chair of the National Aboriginal Head Start Council. 
Patsy and her husband Sean have two adult children, Josie and Rice, and three grandchildren, Elizabeth, Abigail, and Rice. In her spare time, she loves beating, reading, and being out on the land. So to, to carry on this definition, Patsy, I'd like to also ask you, what is land-based learning? Uh, well, for us, it, it was just um, trying to get our kids outside. Um, we just really feel they are surrounded by too much plastic um, and too much uh, digital products. And so it was really important to get them outside. Thank you, Patsy. We know that when we're, uh, as educators, when we do this type of work, at times there are challenges, at times uh, there are things that we have to overcome. So I'd like to go to Willie with our next question, is what is the biggest challenge land-based learning faces? Uh, the biggest challenge, um, I'll ask you to forgive me on this one as I, as I start to talk about it. Uh, the biggest challenge really is the school system. Um, and forgive me on that, because I, I know school is important, that we, we need to, to know, learn about what is offered in school. But at the same time, it, it's very challenging to have a, a certain kind of worldview that really disrupts our minds, our, our young people's minds. and and forces them away from, you know, the living world that surrounds them. It, it, the challenge is to have our curriculums be able to teach about how people uh, develop their intuitions, how people develop their, their emotional, emotional wellness, how people develop their holistic self so that, that they can use, um, that they become independent learners and not have prescriptions from the scholastic, scholastic system to, to tell them what the world is all about, that uh, we need to have different models of education that will teach us about intuition, about dreaming, about uh, feeling about uh, giftedness, about all these things that we, we, we really need in order to effectively engage with the world. Excellent. Thank you, Willie. You know, as uh, as an older generation, we many times that's what we look for in our children is that individual learning, that individual understanding of who they are in the world and the world that surrounds them. So I thank you for that feedback, Patsy. I would ask, like to ask you the same question: What is the biggest challenge land-based learning faces? Well, I think for us, because we are in an urban center, um, we have to use our city parks so that. Uh, you know, turned out to be an incredible asset um, that we had to develop some significant partnerships with the city um, and we use uh, public spaces. So with public spaces, there are sometimes some risks. So our educators had to be, you know, well-trained on risk assessment because these are incredibly young children. Um, and so, you know, they're two to five year old. So we have to be mindful of that. Some of them don't have language yet um, and they have, you know, potty needs. Uh, and so we had to, re we had to be really make sure the educators were well-trained um, uh, to make sure they can look after these kids and then to use that space in the city. So, uh, you know, where many First Nation communities have a land base, uh, we have a, urban center with a huge parking lot. Uh, and we did have a playground and I, we, we completely uh, emptied the playground of all uh, prefabricated structures and we're trying to go back to more natural things. So the, the challenge is to make sure uh, that the children are safe and that the educators are well-trained. 
Thank you, Patsy. Such an important point about uh, the safety when we go out and we do this work. Uh, well planned out lessons as well. And you bring forth a very important concept of this land base of land based learning, and that is uh, urban centers. This also happens within urban centers. It's as I always tell people, it's not out just out in the far out spaces where there's no population. It's also in our urban centers within our in, in our cities, within our towns, that we need to find uh, spaces in which we can interact with. So Lisa, I'd like to now turn it over to you to ask you what, from your perspective, are some of the biggest challenges land-based learning faces? So I won't speak so much about liability and money, but those will forever be challenges um, for any um, organization or community that wants to, wants to set something like that up. I would have to say that a couple of the biggest challenges that I've seen is fear. Um, a lot of times there's a fear of change. We've been so accustomed to Western education and Western systems, and now we're, we're, we're shifting, that sometimes there's a fear that, oh, if we change, our children will miss out on something, or um, we're steering them towards uh, a path or an academic or, or career path that may not be relevant. And that, that really isn't the, the need or the, the focus of this. It, it really is about connecting, connecting our kids to their roots, to, to, to the teachings of the earth. And, and of course, we have to have uh, trust. Uh, again, that is a challenge, is we're putting uh, our children in a, in, a, in, a, in a brand new way of learning. So getting trust from parents, community members, um, in that trust the philosophy of what we're trying to uh, include in their learning can sometimes be a challenge, but uh, it, it, it's so worth it. Thank you, Lisa, for that. You know, there's been a lot of research lately looking at um, the importance of knowing who you are, knowing your identity, knowing your roots and where you come from. And that land-based work really uh, is essential in that work. I'm going to go back to Patsy on this one. We, we've um, been thinking about, at a young age, starting our children out young before school starts, um, ingra ingraining and implementing land-based learning. So the question from Melissa Mittenen is, how do we incorporate land-based learning into Aboriginal Head Start programs? Ideas for implementation for ages two to five would be appreciated. Um, well, that is the, that's our target uh, population that we serve is two to five. And, um, and you know, we, we, it took us about a, a good year and a half to develop the program that we have. And um, I just think it's really important to do it. So uh, make sure your staff have what they need. So it's really important um, that you have buy-in from staff, but you also have to have buy-in from parents um, so that they understand the value in it. And then one of the things that we tried to make sure of is that we didn't burden families with the expense. So, um, you know, we, we, we purchase, we have snowshoes, we have a lending program, uh, where we will lend out all our camping equipment, all our gear. Um, and, uh, and it's just, it's, it's about doing it. So if it's, if it's important, you'll find a way to do it. And if not, you'll find an excuse not to do it. So like I said, we're, we're an urban center um, and we, uh, we it, it took some convincing to get some of the staff to buy in as well, because uh, I too was saying, I hate being cold. Uh, you know, I live in New Brunswick and, and we're in the middle of a storm right now. And so realizing that uh, making sure kids are comfortable, um, that they have everything they need when they're out there, that the staff are well resourced when they're out there. Um, and, and so it's not, so for us, the philosophy isn't about teaching their ABCs and their one, two, threes, they're gonna learn that. Um, but it's to instill a love of learning. And what better place to instill a love of learning than out on the land um, where it changes constantly, the weather changes, uh, we're using public parks, which are, uh, particular park that we're using has a lot of old growth forest and um, and they're surrounded by nature. So um, it's been a fabulous experience for us and, and 
we do our best to try to encourage others to do it. And um, it's just a matter of trying to find some creative ways to get it done. Thank you very much, Patsy. I, I was uh, asking that, starting with you with that question because of your extensive background in working with Head Start and uh, youth. I'd also like to ask uh, Willie Ermine the same question about when we're thinking about our youth ages two to five, um, what are some of the things that we need to implement for youth at that age when we're thinking about land-based learning? <laughs> In our children, what do we need to see? Um, how do we need to engage our children for them to see land-based learning, to understand land-based learning at a very young age before school starts? I, I think it's a perfect age to, to uh, keep children in tune with their natural, the natural elements, uh, to keep them in tune with the land, to keep them in tune with uh, the energies and the feelings that they get from land and the, the amazing stuff that they must see. A two-year-old sees the land so differently than we do. You know, we've been, uh, we, we've been injected with all kinds of ideas about what is out there. Uh, but children see the world differently. And I think um, it's not so much getting children out on the land uh, as it is that we can learn from them. I think if we take our children out there in the land and ask them questions about what they are seeing, what they are feeling, what what it is that that is happening on the land, we can learn so much from them instead of the other way around. We're not teaching them about the land. All we're doing is really um, getting them engaged with uh, uh, something that they were born with and that we don't want to destroy their way of seeing the world. So any, any activity on the land and, and not to label things for them, not to construct a world for them uh, to label this tree as an aspen poplar, that doesn't do any good. Uh, but to ask them what that tree feels like, and it's it's a development of the of the energies that 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 happen out on the land, and and little children, especially in Head Start, will have those kind of energies, and I think we should maintain them and learn from them, and and work with children in terms of how we develop curriculum. I think uh, don't let the adults develop curriculum; let allow the children to develop those. You bring forth, Willie, a concept of uh, hierarchy that's present, ever present in our society, but also in our educational systems. And you, you bring forth such an important point about how the classification of things is not the importance, it's to engage with the land, to feel the land, to embrace it, to have that emotion, those emotions alongside the land. So I thank you for bringing forth that concept of hierarchy that we want to instill as human beings when we, when we do this type of work. Lisa, I have a question from Kelly Mastro Joblin, and what are your thoughts on introducing risk-taking in land-based learning with children? At any age, I guess. Um, so, in our community, we often have community-wide events where the whole community is involved. We have uh, a moose camp, we have a fish camp, and we, we shut down our, our programs and the community goes out to these camps to engage in the activity of fish harvesting, moose harvesting. And it's really about a communal, a communal activity, communal basis. And as young as, um, you know, the children are in daycare, they're included in that. Their parents come out, they're included. And as old as our high school students, they're all out there. Um, there are different things that we do uh, as a community to coordinate in terms of safety and risks, um, but it really is about um, parent involvement and the parents learning and taking that responsibility with us as educators. We're simply facilitators. We coordinate. We are in no means the experts that uh, teach these skills or teach the parents or teach the children. We do a lot of coordinating and a lot of the knowledge and skills that are passed on come from the elders and knowledge keepers in the community. And so when you do these types of activities, a lot of parents come 
a lot of our parents come out with uh, with their children and that mitigates, you know, some of the risks that are involved in these activities. Lisa, I'm going to come back to you with a question, but I'll let you catch, catch your breath for a second. I think you bring forth such um, an integral piece of land-based education, and that's humility. I also want to say bonjour to uh, Sharon Stevenson and Peguas as well. Uh, I appreciate the comments and the, and the things that keep flowing in. But Lisa, if you could, could you share with us a little bit more in detail your program? So our program that runs in the community, we, about 14 years ago, we took the curriculum back to the community, back to the parents, back to the membership. And we asked, we put forth the question, what is it that you want your children to learn in, in, in our education system? Because it really is about taking, um, taking back the responsibility to educate our children. We're a sovereign nation. We have the capability to do it. You know, we need to stop relying on Western curriculum to teach what our children need in life. So when we did that, we ended up uh, developing a curriculum based on our community, what we felt that, that was important in the community. And it, and it, and it doesn't become um, a something that we do on the side. It really is about priority and putting it up there uh, as just as important as science or language arts. And in fact, we do a lot of cross-curricular activities where, you know, we may have been out for two weeks for moose camp or moose hunting or fish harvesting, but that learning doesn't start on that week, nor does it stop. We integrate a lot of it into, into what the children are doing in the classrooms. So our programming was really about taking the beliefs and the important things about being Nishnabe in Bitagon and making it a priority and engraving it and embedding it within our systems in itself. And we've also been successful in the high school program, offering credits uh, for Ontario Secondary School Diploma based on our histories, our ways of life and our culture for secondary students. Thank you. I want to bring forth a little bit of a story. Kathy Snow makes a comment that community relationship building among people and the environment is so important. I want to bring forth a story that I had the opportunity to engage in early in December. I went out to Sturgeon Lake and I spent some time with a, a group of young men who they call the Little Mushrooms Group. And this reciprocity of wood harvesting and uh, deer meat that they gave back to the community after they had harvested the wood, after they had harvested uh, the deer, they took that stuff that they had uh, pulled together and they gave it back to the community. What a, what a beautiful opportunity for youth and to benefit their community, to have a positive light within their community, but more importantly, to see the smiles and the stories of the faces of those that are loved in their community. So there's another question from Amy about while land-based while land-based cultural and traditional learning is ideally taught by Indigenous educators within the schools, we lack qualified Indigenous instructors numerically across the country. What are your thoughts on how academic institutions can still organize a land-based program that is respectful to the local Indigenous communities and cultures while having non-Indigenous educators oversee the classroom? I'd like to turn to Willie for that first. We'll start with Willie for that, uh, with that first one, and then we'll hear what um, Patsy has to say next. Uh, uh, let me approach this this way that uh, even though it's called land-based learning, uh, we still have to define that quite, uh, extensively. Um, but it's not, um, it's not, uh, how can I say this? What we need to develop in ourselves is the most important. That's what we want to teach children and, and, and youth. What we have to develop within ourselves and we take that from our cultural past, our old people, how they engage with the land, what was important to them, how did they treat the world around them, how did they engage with uh, all of life, not only terrestrial, but cosmic as well. 
Um, and what what was it? What was the key feature that that was really honored in the community? How people would uh, best develop their humanity, and 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 so that is, uh, I think, what we are striving for in land-based learning. Even though it's called land-based learning, we might we might call it. Uh, self-development learning or the development of the intuition. It's the development of our capacity for feeling, our capacity to work with energies that are all all around us. And uh, there's a little exercise that, for example, if you, where you are sitting right now, everybody, where you are sitting right now, focus on yourself, your feelings, not your intellect, not your mind not your thoughts, but to focus on your feeling and really have a look around your room and, and see what it is that captures your attention in that room. And when you, when you, when you look at that uh, attention grabbing, whatever it is, object, um, ask it what it feels like. Ask yourself, what does that feel like? Not what it looks like, what, you know. How does that feel like in your heart, with your feelings? And in, in that whole process, we start to see that it's a different kind of training that needs to happen. And that kind of training can happen in any, any classroom or in any academic setting. Uh, the first, first of all, to, to learn what it is that we need to train. It's not the intellect so much that we need to train, but it's something else. It's the intuition. And this is what the old people talked about, what we need to, uh, uh, to develop in our inner capacity, our inwardness. These are the important items, and this is eventually what we hope to get to when we do land-based learning, to know how to work with those inner energies so that we, we get, we're, we're, we're living in reality. Tonse, I want to acknowledge Jeff, Jeff Kappel from Regina Public Schools. Um, you know, what a thing that he is grappling with within his uh, large system. Um, and I'd like to go to Patsy, like I said on this, but I first want to let you know that you can also interact by texting 306-840-8777. So Patsy, I'd like to go to you on this, on how um, do you create an authentic uh, land-based program when you don't necessarily have the resources of uh, Indigenous people? Um, well, that's the, that is it's a really good question, but it is the challenge. So the majority of our children, and I don't think that's unique to New Brunswick, the majority of our Indigenous kids are going into mainstream institutions. That's the reality. So they're uh, they're going into mainstream daycare center, centers or early child care facilities of some sort. And um, I think it's really important um, for anybody who's working with Indigenous children to examine their own biases and their own place of privilege because, um, you know, and I can give you an example of what some of our kids are facing. So we have, you know, well-intended um, daycare workers saying things like, we don't allow toy guns in our facilities because we don't promote violence. Well, we don't promote violence either, but we don't mind toy guns in our facility. The majority of our kids have grown up with uh, parents that hunt or relatives that hunt. I'm from multiple generations of hunters. I grew up with guns. Uh, my husband's an avid hunter. My kids grew up with guns. We're not violent. Um, but when those things get said in these in mainstream institutions, um, they have to think about the effect that has on our children. Um, so, so even coming from that, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what they, how they can learn to be good land-based educators. Uh, I just think they need to learn to be good educators in general and to be mindful that, um, you know, our kids are attending these institutions and sometimes what they're facing um, can be, can be really racist, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, and so I think if, you know, if, you, if people in mainstream institutions think about that, and then they can reach out to community to, to ask elders to come in. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of this and nothing against animal rights activists, um, but I don't have a problem with having, you know, an elder come in and teach our kids uh, how to skin an animal, how to field dress an animal. Um, but that would be considered cruel and inhumane in some mainstream institutions. So people need to be mindful of that, I think. And so that's why I think it's really important for us to take on the role. And by us, I mean Indigenous people. It needs to come from us. Thank you, Patsy. When I started this journey in education 17 plus years ago, I started to think about how many times we alienate and we leave community and families outside of the school. How we don't do a good job of inviting them in to share that their skills and their abilities. We don't go meet them in their spaces of learning and knowledge. So you bring forth an important point, Patsy, as you, you talked about uh, the variety of skill sets that families have and the variety of understandings that are out there for us to learn. But it always comes with an ethical, reciprocal relationship. I think those are very key and essential pieces and I, I think uh, it's important to understand that that's the role of good education, that's the role of a good educator is to have ethical, reciprocal relationships that are ongoing. So Jimmy Therian uh, asks a question and I want to go to um, Lisa for this one. Lisa, how do you see energy and climate change education in the lens of land-based and Indigenous perspective? I think that's extremely important and I think that really is one of the goals in delivering land-based education per se. Um, the human race is so disconnected from what is happening in our world today in regards to energy, in regards to climate change. Um, our relationship with the land and the things that we do to the land is now affecting us. And so through opportunities of land-based learning, we're hoping to really instill in our children the importance of taking care of the earth, the importance of having that connection with her, because that was really one of our responsibilities that the we were given as Indigenous people. And so they really do go hand in hand uh, without a doubt. Thank you, Lisa. I um, did an interview this morning with Blue Sky Radio and one of the things I was thinking about when we were thinking about climate change and the importance of land-based education if we're talking about the water, if they go out and they interact with the water, they'll see how people are, are changing that, how the way in which we construct society and construct our environment, how we're, we're actually having quite a negative impact on the water. But again, that's things that we feel through our experience. I want to pull up our, our first uh, text question, and this text question is to Willie. How do we not label the trees or the birds or the different species we come across when we are on the land teaching land-based healing? To our children, what is the proper way to approach that? Thanks from Roland and SIT in Saskatoon. Thank you, good question. Um, the, initial, uh, the initial engagement with, with the land really has to be uh, to take children out there, to take youth out on the land. Uh, it's, it's our belief, it's the belief of our people that if we take the children out on the land, the land will teach them. And, and that's the whole, the whole premise, that, that, that is the intent. Allow the land to teach the children, to teach us. And, and in, in the same way, uh, with um, if we go back to our Cree creation narratives, all the different plants, all the animals, all the terrestrial beings, one by one spoke to the Creator at that time and told the Creator, begged the Creator how they would help us as human beings. And in that narrative lies the whole idea that we have to allow the land to tell us what it wants. Um, we have to allow, we have to tell the land also uh, in terms of what we want. And uh, this goes back to Lisa's point that we have to, uh, we've lost contact with the land. 
and and so the the tree themselves the the animals the the plants they are the ones that tell us what their purpose is and that information flow is what's critical well, you're not going to have a tree standing there telling you, I am good for this purpose, you know, I'm good, I'm good to heal this sickness and all that. We're not going to listen, we're not going to hear them in that way. There's a different way of messaging that happens when we are out on the land, and it's a different way of messaging, messaging we, we need to get in tune with and to train ourselves to be able to, uh, to hear that. So the plants will tell us what they are good for, but first we need to engage our children to be able to feel the world around them, to be able to feel the lands and the plants and animals, and in that way have capacity to hear messages from those beings. What a beautiful way to understand that, Willie. It's, um, you know... It's so true how the land will continue to teach us and guide us. The other day I was going out for research with a new researcher and they said, well, what's the plan? What's the plan? What are we going to do? What does it look like? And I said, the plan will come to us. It'll, it'll come as we, as we experience this. It'll come in the most natural format that it is. And so many times we want to classify and understand exactly how it will be, what it will be. And uh, sometimes you're right, Willie. We just need to go back to listening to the land and understanding what it has to tell us. Patsy, when I read your bio, I was thinking about all the chairs and the councils that you sat on, and I have a question from Helen Van Veen, and it is, is there funding available to create projects of land-based learning? A lot of work <laughs> to, to try to do it, but um, uh, there are, and, and I, I can't list them here right now, but... Um, you can also do some significant fundraising around it, which is which is what we've done. Um, and and it's interesting uh, how many people are interested in it and want to help. So we have a um, multitude of institutions in New Brunswick that are excited about what we're doing, um, and you know they reach out often to help us. So um, you know. Uh, big companies, so like MEC, Mountain Equipment Co-op, um, you know, will sometimes um, uh, help folks out. Um, and I'm just kind of rack on my brain trying to think of some of these other places that can help out. Um, applying for funding is not one of my favorite things to do, but it is one of the things I'm forced to do. Um, but yeah, but and it is well worth it. So there's also, uh, uh, we applied for funding through the uh, Toronto Dominion, uh, Friends of the Environment, uh, and got a significant grant from them. So you have to get, you, have, you can Google it. Um, you have to get really creative and, and reach out to multiple sources uh, to get the funding. But it is well worth it. It's well worth it. And I, you know, just um, to, to just talk a little bit about what Willie was saying about, um, you know, just it's important to get kids out on the land and it can't be just a one shot deal. So it has to be on a, a daily regular basis because that's the only way they can experience the reality of the environment the change in the seasons and what's happening so for instance here in new brunswick um you know uh, we have had had incredibly significant flooding um and even our little kids are now aware of this significant flooding of the willistook river and um how would they know that if you just take them out once so they have to be out on a regular basis Patsy. I'm going to go to Lisa with the same question, but first I want to acknowledge the comments that you're making on Facebook right now. This is what I wanted to get out of this panel. I wanted to ensure that uh, people could hear these stories and hear their story alongside what they're hearing. So Lisa, I'd like to ask you the same question. Are there funding opportunities for land-based learning? There is. There's funding opportunities communities, uh, again, at provincial levels, probably at uh, federal levels, being in the, the field of education and having um, to be under the federal government, there was opportunity for funding. But ultimately, what our community did under our leadership is they, they basically said that this is a priority and we will find the money if the money is needed to have these uh, 
um, activities, to get equipment, to do what we have to do. And again, I want to reiterate that it, it does take some creativity, but uh, the reality is money is probably about the easiest thing to get in, in this regard. And even then, when it's not really there, a lot of it is coming from the parents. The parents have also made it a priority. So again, depending on where the priority is within the communities, communities can do it. Um, again, creativity and, and, and looking at different ways to do what you need to do and get what you need to get. Thank you very much, Lisa. Lisa, I'm going to stick with you. I have uh, one more request uh, that's coming in from our comments, and uh, it says that Lisa has an amazing natural playground in the forest of Pick River. I'm wondering if she can share how they developed this beautiful space for the children. So that natural playground um, is actually at our Early Childhood Learning Centre. And again, it came from the concepts that our children, at, especially at that age, need opportunity for natural place, place, places. And again, it's not so much giving them all the toys, giving them all the commercial type uh, equipment and toys for them to, to utilize. It really is about giving them the space in a natural setting amongst the trees, amongst the the ground and and just giving them some small naturally based um, uh, equipment or things to to kind of trigger their curiosity and letting them go at it. And again, I reflect on on our moose camp when our children are out there. A lot of them are not taking uh, commercial toys out there to occupy. And it's funny because I, I over the years I've seen the girls. Uh, and boys, they come up with their own games and, and they're doing it using rocks, they're using it in trees, they're using pieces of wood. So it really, we're so used to providing kids with something to do with equipment, with with toys that, that don't come naturally. And we're not allowing their minds to grow with their natural environment. So when we do take those things um, away, it takes a little bit of time, but it comes. Kids are curious and they're smart. And our our, uh, our natural playground for our early childhood center really fosters that philosophy. Thank you, Lisa. I want to acknowledge Aaron Bula, Star Chief at Mosquito School and Mosquito Grizzly Bears Head Lean Man, First Nation Saskatchewan, telling us that land-based learning is happening for the grade uh, pre-K to grade eight students in their school. I want to acknowledge that many times these programs and uh, this type of learning is happening. It's for us to seek out and find the resources and the people that we can partner with to, to develop this. My next question is to Willie, and it's how do you get non-Indigenous people that are in control of provincial education systems to include land-based education in the curriculum when they do not understand the importance of it? Well, it is happening. Um, here and there, it's happening. And I think that the task for all of us whether in, in school, within curriculum development, within the community, is to make uh, that bandwagon of land-based learning so exciting that people want to get on. Uh, we have to uh, make it evidence-based that um, it, it, is, um, it, it does change attitudes. I know gifted children, for example, who have a lot of problems in school, by the way, uh, really respond to land-based learning. And I think um, if, if, we, if, if we start to change, if we make the bandwagon so exciting to be on that people want to come on board and there's evidence based for successes in that area, I think it, it'll, it'll keep growing. It's, it's, and right now we're in a process, I think we're in a process of um, experimenting. That, that's how I see it. We, we are uh, currently experimenting and we haven't really fine-tuned this whole process yet because we're still defining, we're still trying to find out what, to, what, what it is really that we have to teach and learn. 
so it's an experiment, but we need to re really do need to create models because if you're asking the province to to create uh, land-based education, for example, well, give them a model. If they don't know how to do it, they need a model to do it. They need somebody to teach them. And I know there are a lot of teachers out there right now in the classrooms, perhaps watching here, that are engaged with this and still <laughs> trying to understand, understand it or working to um, uh, put in, in effect their understanding of what land-based education is. I know it, it, they're out there and we just have to allow this to continue and make it exciting, make it really exciting so that a lot of people, including families in the communities, the parents, want to get involved with these activities. So make it exciting. I'm going to stick with you, Willie, on this on the second part of this question. I think it pairs really well with what you've just said. It's from Bert Fox School. I thank Bert Fox for tuning in um, from uh, cent South Central Saskatchewan. And the question is, how do we balance needing to measure learning, marks and credits, when we are trying to see learning as a process, not a product? <laughs> uh, Dustin, I'm going to get you later for this question. <laughs> uh, it's perhaps a question I really haven't thought of, but um, and, and that's why I think uh, the Cree the have a term for mamo kamatuin. This word talks about uh, getting together, getting together um, all, all the different people involved. Oh, uh, curriculum, what kind of curriculum needs to be developed? How does it need to be formatted? How does it need to be processed? The, like I said, these, this is an experiment and these are the, uh, the, this is the fine tuning that needs to happen. And, and I think there are people out there who are uh, skilled and they're very articulate and they can, uh, can, they can make the bandwagon so exciting by uh, you know, formatting new models. And that's 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 the current struggle. I mean, not a, it's not so much a struggle, but it's a current. Uh, it's the current process, the current progress. Excellent. Uh, I've continued to uh, look at my phone and see the texts that are coming in about this conversation. I want to acknowledge uh, NITEP and UBC. The program is learning to incorporate land-based learning in their program so they can localize and authentically teach it as we enter our careers. Also, um, um, Maggie uh, Sinwink is pairing retired teachers and students would be great combining learning experiences. Such beautiful things that you're putting forth and ideas that are happening and stemming from this conversation. I'd now like to turn to Patsy to ask her, what are the main impacts or transformations that land-based learning has on the community? Um, well, I, I think it stilled uh, an excitement, as, as Willie mentioned, about learning in general. Um, but it also encouraged us to um, find a way to teach the language, uh, more of the language. So our, our languages here in the Maritimes are, um, at, we're at risk of losing them. And, um, the most one one of the most interesting things that happened early on in the program was how the educators um, said it was so much easier to teach the language in that natural environment because the language already exists around all of that. Whereas in a classroom, you know, they had to stop and think about how do I translate that, you know, the desk or a chair or a cup uh, into. Um, uh, Malice and out on the land, um, they didn't even have to think because everything that is there, the language already existed around it. So it was incredibly exciting uh, for them to, you know, to come back and talk about that. I'm not even sure if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did, Patsy. Thank you. I want to acknowledge also Jane Archuk. Um, schools in the Northwest Territories have been offering land-based opportunities for students of all ages from preschool to college. I want to acknowledge that because this is not a, a brand new concept, land-based learning. It is thousands of years old. And if we go back to our Indigenous roots of many of us, we will see that our main 
main places of learning and spaces of learning happened on the land. So Willie, part of the reason why we wanted to do this interactive uh, panel is because people could ask questions based on what we're saying. So I want to go to Michelle uh, Thibault's comment. So she says, Willie, how do we create the models that you're referencing? The models that I would be thinking of <laughs> doesn't just t told us this is thousands of years old. This, um, come come from our culture, of course, the models. So how how did we live with the land? Um, how did our people live with the land? How did they? How were they humans on the land? So the models, those models, come to us from the past. Um, but if we're thinking contemporaneously, uh, for example, if we had a lesson, uh, say a curriculum, one-page curriculum paper we're following in school, well, that can de to develop into a, a whole lot more. For example, you need uh, we we would need to do um, uh, exercises or maybe even have a, a, a camp setting where we do the different exercises so that becomes a camp setting becomes a part of the model not only uh, a hunting camp or um, you know but um, a community camp might uh, could also be part of it um, but it and and we can have the young people videotaping the whole the different Exercises that are happening within that uh, within the camp, for example, skinning deer or hunting rabbits or choke cherry crushing or singing or dancing, any of these that they themselves, the young people themselves, start to create those models. They, they they'll create the videos of how to do choke cherry crushing, for example. Um, uh, they will interview elders. They will they will then um, sit in a, a feast setting, maybe a feast setting where they they eat. Everybody eat gets to eat what they've created, uh, and everybody gets to watch what they what the, what the, what they've done. Um, so it becomes um, a very holistic and very expanded. Uh, if you want to call it curriculum unit. Uh, but these models, these processes uh, uh, to teach about intuition in the classroom, to have exercises in intuition development, uh, to, put, to create context where that intuition works, and to um, include uh, many people where that, uh, that kind of intuition might be helpful or interactive. Uh, and so forth and so forth, this becomes what we as teachers would know as curriculum unit. It, it, it becomes a very expanded exercise of uh, not only learning about the land, but actually um, uh, taking ownership of that learning to create videos and to and to show it to the people and to be able to teach it to the people. This is what I call models and, 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 and I think um, um, it, it, um, that, that would be my response, Dustin. <laughs> so, so thank you very much, Willie. We want to go to a final question here to, to wrap this up. And I'll first go to Patsy and then Lisa, and we'll allow uh, Willie an opportunity to, to gather his thoughts and take a breath here, and I'll, I won't hit him with five questions <laughs> in a row. So, um, Patsy, the final question we have for you is, if we can take one thing away from each of, uh, each of this for land-based learning, what are your final thoughts? Do it. Just do it. It's um, and don't complicate it. Um, I think um, it, you know, like I said earlier, if it's important, you'll find a way, and if not, you'll find an excuse. Um, and it it might mean using your creativity. Um, and it is worth it. It is worth the effort. Uh, it is worth the time. Um, and the and the and we will be able to reap the benefits in the next generation. Thank you very much, Patsy. Lisa, I'd like to come to you with the same question. If, if there's one thing that we can take away um, from land-based learning, what are your final thoughts? My final thoughts are that it takes time, but the longer you sit and wait, um, the longer you're going to see the results. Uh, it ultimately um, is one of the best things that we've done in our community. 
And we may not see a change immediately tomorrow, but we are seeing changes as the children have been involved in this in the last 15 years. So again, don't be scared. Like Patsy said, it, it just has to be done. Um, find a way to do it, reach out there, um, get community and parents involved, and uh, you'll see the successes come along the way. Wonderful last thought, Lisa. Now I'd like to turn that over to Willie. Uh, Willie, can I get your last uh, thoughts on what's one thing that we need to take forth with land-based uh, learning? The one thing that really strikes me all the time is that this is about us, each and every one of us. Um, this is about our humanity. It's, uh, it, it starts to scour our, ourselves about what capacity we have as human beings to be able to um, engage in conversation with the land, for example, with climate change happening. Um, you know, our elders have told us it's because we have been disengaged with the land that we are no longer communicating with the land. The mother wants to tell us things. We want to uh, tell the mother uh, how, you know, what it is that we need in our lives. So that capacity, that inner capacity, that is ultimately what we're trying to develop. And that's what the old people have always stressed that, you know, to be a good human being, develop your side, de de develop, develop your inwardness, your, your spiritual self, and your capacity to uh, do, um, to treat the, the rest of the world the best way that you can as a good human being. Wonderful final words, Willie. We would like to do further digital forms, and what we'd ask you to do is please uh, send us your thoughts on what you'd like to see at contact at nccie.ca. Also, I would like to uh, give deep thanks to the three panelists who are present here today. I'd also like to thank everybody who's tuned in and who's provided comments and questions. This is such a beautiful conversation that uh, requires much more work as we've identified here today. There are uh, many inlets and outlets as to what we can um, observe and come alongside to, to, uh, to further this type of work. So, um, thank you to all the guests. Thank you for all the experiences that they've faced in their lives so they can bring forth those, those stories of experience. And thank you to all the people um, who have logged in. And I hope you to continue this conversation on here and it, after in the conclusion and years uh, going on, I please in encourage you to go to our website at nccie.ca to look at the many stories that are happening across Canada, the many Indigenous knowledges that communities feel are important for people to learn, and to continue the conversation of learning and collaborating with each other so we can make a more beautiful world in education. Thank you very much, Chi to all who have been here today.